Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Data Diversity. Thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss emerging trends in data architecture. What's the next big thing? Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, just click the chat icon, which is in the bottom middle of your screen to activate that feature. For questions, we will be clicking via the Q&A section, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag DA Strategies. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you the speaker of this series, Donna Burbank. She is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years experience, helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello. Always a pleasure to join you. Looking forward to a great 2019. Um, so on that note, um, if you have not joined us in previous series, um, welcome. And today is the beginning of a monthly series um, we'll be doing each month on data architecture and various strategies in architecture. But as, as it is January in the beginning of the year, we thought it would be interesting to start with some thoughts on emerging trends in data architecture and what is that next big thing? Or maybe what's not the big thing anymore, what's sort of <laughs> passe, right? So we'll start with that, but please do look through uh, the, re the rest of the year and hopefully there's things of interest to you next month we'll be talking about data strategy and you'll see we have some interesting case studies coming up after that uh, so please do join us on future webinars always a pleasure to virtually see you and for those of you who do uh, come up and say hi at some of the data diversity conferences and things in person I always appreciate that as well because I see some familiar names on the call uh, today and it's always nice to put a face to a name so Welcome to those who come back um, regularly. So today, um, as I mentioned, we're talking about emerging trends in data architecture. And if you've heard me speak before, I'm always um, stressing the, the the exciting time that it is in, in data because it really is such a link now with business. And I'm a business person at heart, and the, I can sort of link two of my favorite things, economics and, and data together. This is the time to do it um, because the, the world is changing. Um, so although that's exciting um, and I'm I'm a big old nerd and it's really fun to be in data management right now because technology is changing so fast and there's so much opportunity but with that opportunity um, it can be a bit overwhelming of where to begin what are those things I should really pay attention to what do I have in the corner of my eye and what should I avoid uh, that maybe other folks uh, tripped on first as an early adopter and maybe you don't want to make that same mistake so We'll do that, but as always, I, I will try to, uh, as Shannon mentioned, I run a consultancy as well, and we have customers uh, in various industries all over the globe doing this, and hopefully I can provide you some practical value for what we've seen from all of our customers and what actually works and what we can actually do, because I know there's a lot of theory, there's a lot of, a lot of things we could do and read about, but what actually works, so we'll kind of stress that today as well. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, data is hot and data is hot because it's driving business. And this is a, an article a colleague pointed out to me a couple months ago, um, and I love it because it really sums up so much of what I'm always stressing as well, that we are in the data-driven digital economy. And this is from the World Economic Forum, and they did an interesting study. So if you look even just five years ago, and five years ago is not that long, uh, it just seems like just yesterday, the largest companies in the, in the marketplace were selling stuff. They were selling things. So things like Walmart, I mean, they're the classic thing seller, right? Or Exxon, um, you know, they're, they're selling products and services. Now, if you look in, in 2018, just last year, um, I think this has changed even more so with, with some of the percentages. The, the leading companies are focused on data or technology or digital. And when I hear digital, I hear data because digital is driven by data. And they had an interesting quote um, that now in this information economy, data is now literally more valuable than physical tangible objects. Even companies like Amazon that sell product, of course, 
really their differentiator is data and not only the amount of data they have and the amount of data they leverage, but how they use that data. The recommendation engine, you bought this, bought, would you, you might like this. I mean, that's AI, that's big data. That's, they're actually doing a lot of um, cutting edge things with data, which really give them that strategic advantage as well as things in the back end with supply chain, right? So whatever your industry, there is data associated and that's a great time to be in data. And so I really like this um, quote. Uh, you can read the reference there and if you wanna read the full article. Some of the other things I'll be touching on as well, they actually go into a bit more detail on what some of the drivers are, even things like visualization. You know, it's not always the back end, often it's the front end that's making it more accessible to business users. Um, and so I kind of brought this back to my practice and what I'm seeing, and I just did a bit of a, you know, back of the envelope calculation of, you know, when we have customers from around the globe working with us, what are the main drivers they're seeing? I thought that might be helpful for you. And really across the board, eight out of 10 or 80%, um, in some way, shape, or form, we're doing a, a bit of digital transformation and typically use that word. And, and we'll go through and we'll talk a little bit more about the, the range of industries but um, it, it could be a complete web-based application from a brick and mortar store. Um, it could be, I'll talk a bit more, one of our company's uh, customers is a small nonprofit and, and they're making everything more automated and digital because they don't have a lot of staff. So really, if you think that data management is not something you can leverage in your industry or that digital transformation sounds like a buzzword and that's not for you, um, think again, because it really is something that, it, yes, it's a buzzword. <laughs> we love buzzwords in our industry, um, but it does not make it not real. I, I guess an analogy I like to use too, old enough to remember the, the dot-com era, right? And everyone said, oh, that was a, a, a boom and bust, right? The dot-com era. Just, so maybe stock market-wise, yes, there was a bit of bust, but what isn't dot-com? <laughs> Think of Amazon.com. It, it was a buzzword that actually became a living reality, and that is our life. I mean, brick and mortar stores are going away in replacement of dot com. So digital transformation, I see really is that next generation of what we started as dot com. It's really making that literally more data driven. So found that interesting and it's kind of fun to do these because again, as I mentioned, um, if you are the type of person that loves data, but also loves the bigger picture, I mean, I've said on previous calls, I was an economics major, you know, starting out when I, when I was younger, um, and, and being able to meld those two now in such a nice way that the data is driving business and you really can have a seat at the table, really doing digital and business transformation. So it's a great time to be in the biz. This, I put together my own little visualization, um, mostly accurate. I didn't do the, the full, uh, you know, Python model here to, to generate this visualization. But what I found interesting and why I love my job, I'll just come out and say it, because I get to work with so many different companies across the globe doing such different things. Um, and what I also found interesting is the range of industries. So if you are in the business as long as I've been, when we grew up in data management, basically it was finance, insurance, maybe government, a bit of healthcare, right? Th those were the ones that either had the pockets to do data management um, or had the need and regulation. So, you know, I'll be a bit of a cynic, often there's opportunity, but often it was regulations that make you have data audit and things like that. So finance, insurance, if you're in data management, for over 10 years, you're, you've probably been doing something in those markets. So the fact that that's the big old blue one in the middle is not a surprise. But what I am eagerly, pleasantly surprised is some of the different ones you see there. So look at that big light blue one lower bottom. And this is from our customer base. So I, I, I cannot, this is not a industry-wide survey, but it's probably a microcosm of what others are seeing. We're seeing a lot of nonprofits. I mean, one of our most successful customers just won an award for the best managed nonprofit based on data governance and master data management. And they're a Head Start program outside of Detroit. Um, we have some museums we're working with. I mean, folks, I never would have thought, <laughs> if you had asked me 20 years ago, would you be doing you know, advanced uh, data governance and master data management for a Head Start program? Probably not. And that's awesome. Um, and part of why that can happen is, well, we can learn from the folks that did it before. I think most people can see the value in a lot of the tools and technologies, I'll talk more about that, are so, much more accessible to the average person, literally even sitting in their pajamas. If you are that nerdy and want to, you know, do some advanced visualization on the weekends with open data sets, you can. I mean, it's amazing. Um, we're seeing education in universities where we talk so much about 
you know, single view of the customer being customer driven. Well, they're customers, students, you know, human beings. How do we actually determine better outcomes through data? Right? Similarly with healthcare. So we've got several customers in healthcare trying to, you know, some of the typical, how can we get efficiencies by even getting a single view of our providers, um, you know, apply with regulation, but also once we get that down, how do we actually have better outcomes? How do we do, you know, better, you know, patient management? Um, manufacturing, I'm finding that very interesting because so much we think on the front end with customer. Um, and so, of course, these manufacturing customers are also looking at customer because everybody has customers, right? So, um, but also when we think and think of Amazon, again, as an example, the back end supply chain. And this is where things like we'll talk a lot more about AI and artificial intelligence and machine learning are really transforming the business and just optimizing supply chain. Um, one of our, our big customers in Europe is we're working with some analytics and just because of their global scale, even a percentage point of a half a percentage point in an efficiency, when you scale that can really make a difference. So we can talk about KPIs, we can talk about metrics, um, but there's real, especially in things like manufacturing, a small change can make a big difference. So really monitoring those uh, KPIs is completely data driven, right? We're always talking about data driven, but so many more companies are um, even that nonprofit that I'll mention again because I'm so proud of. Um, they have KPIs. I mean, would you think that you would have a, you know your uh, early childhood teacher with KPIs about your children? When you think about it, that makes total sense. How are our children doing on their tests? Who's had their immunization? How are they doing at home? Right, and having your dashboard, your teacher dashboard, so you can really start seeing that change. Um, media and entertainment. I mean, everybody. Um, what I found about that one, I thought it was fun. It was my first client that. Um, PII or personally identifiable information was your avatar. And I had never really thought about that. They had done some online gaming and, and in that world, you, people know you by your avatar. So that was considered PII and had to be sort of masked and obfuscated in the database accordingly. So no matter what industry you're in, um, there is an, a way you can become more data driven. Uh, the restaurant there, they, they were sort of met, um, optimizing their restaurant and I mean, sorry, their menu and, and their supply chain to get the right products on that menu at the best price and having the right menu for the customer. So no matter what it is, you can can use data in a certain way and use some of these tools we'll be talking about in a very innovative way to probably drive more profitability or if you're, again, if you're a nonprofit or your school, better outcomes or healthcare. It isn't all about profit. It's about outcomes. So really a great time uh, to be in data and that's really a democratization of data management. I know this is an eye chart and I'm sorry, but what I, I, I had another slide and then I put this one back in because people, uh, we had some, a lot of people like this kind of radar diagram. But what I found interesting is, so what are people doing? They know they want to do um, digital transformation. They want to be more data driven. One of the things we start with in our practice is a bit of a maturity assessment. So where, my analogy, I think there's an article on data diversity where they sort of quoted me with this analogy on data strategy. I'm a big runner. If you've met me, I'm really hyper, so I'm going to run <laughs> my system. And um, you might come to me and say, I want to run a marathon. And I'm like, that's fine. Anyone can run a marathon. Uh, where are you today? Do you already run a sub three hour marathon and you want to get into the Olympics? Or are you sitting on the couch now and you just want to lose some weight? And do you really need to do a marathon or you just want to jog up 5K? Um, so that's sort of what we do with this idea of strategy. Where do you want to be? Because that, that drives everything else. If I really just want to lose some weight and run a 5K, I don't have to train 20 miles every weekend. If I want to get into the Olympics, I probably do. So that, that's a, this blue line is where do you want to be? Um, and then the rest drives how you get there. So I am seeing most of my customers with a fairly good sense of their business strategy, knowing that they want to be data-driven. They're reading the articles. They're seeing the success stories in the per that previous slide, that people of all industries are becoming data-driven, or I think people are have the question mark, and hopefully, you know, webinars like this with data diversity can help clarify some of that. What, what does that mean? What do I do? Okay, I want to be data-driven. I want to be digital. Got it. What, what, does, what do I do? And that's where that idea of a data strategy comes in. What pieces of data management do I need to do better so I can become data-driven and be a next Amazon, right? So one of the things that I'm pleased to see um, that often comes as a result of that is data governance. And we'll talk a lot more about this. It, it, we often think of data governance as you must do this or the regulators are going to come sue you or your customers are going to come sue you and you're going to get in trouble with the auditors. Yes. 
Um, but it's much more than that now. And it's really a lot more about alignment between your business goals and technology. And most of many of my customers that have data governance committees don't call them that anymore. It's the data innovation council or the data strategy team or the data evolution group. Um, because they really see that in order to manage data as an asset, which is all about what governance is, it's really about innovation and evolution, getting there together and collaboration. And I'm a big fan of saying if you get the right people in the room, um, you don't have to have as many rules. We're all adults. We want to do the right thing. I don't see too many customers um, hiding their data on purpose from each other. It's the fact that we're busy and we have other things to do. So you get right, the right people in the room and, and, and often the rest sort of comes out of that. Uh, master data management is one of those that, you know, what's old is new again, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, I want to be data driven. I want to do the recommendation engines and chatbots and understand customer segmentation and, and data analytics on that. I can't if I don't know who my customer is. Do I have one Donna Burbank or do I have seven people named Donna Burbank and they're all different people or are those seven versions of Donna Burbank um, and she buys a lot of stuff? I'm probably not because I don't buy things. <laughs> I don't know market to me. It doesn't work. <laughs> I'm just working all the time. Um, so the resurgence in that. Data warehousing, and we'll talk a lot about more, more of that as well, was that um, reports of my demise have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> data warehousing is here to stay. Most of my customers have a data warehouse. Many are building brand new data warehouses. Yes, yes, they're still helpful for what they are. Um, are they done a little differently? Yes. Are there tools that you can be more effective? Yes. Can you build it in the cloud now and not have to have your own servers? Yes. So not saying nothing has changed in data warehousing and it's the same as in 1997 when it started, um, but um, you can do a lot more with it. The use case is still there. Um, we just do it differently. Similarly with BI, um, it, huge reinsurgent re or rebirth in that or continued growth in that. I think the tools have become a lot slicker. Um, and I think the big change there is not whether people are doing it, but I think um, this idea of self-service is really everyone wants to do it. <laughs> it's not are you doing it, but who in the organization? Is it just the BI team or is it everyone across the organization? Often what is difficult to scale uh, in self-service, the idea of this metadata layer or semantic layer is what a lot of people are calling it now. Semantics means, what does it mean? What does the data mean? Yes, I see that there's a KPI there. I see that there's a table there, but what the heck does table one, two, three mean? Right? So to make your data consumable, you really need that metadata layer. So um, I, if you've worked with me before, you've seen some of these previous seminars, um, Often, you know, these aren't in a vacuum. You can't do BI without metadata. You can't do governance without metadata. You can't do metadata without data integration, right? So they're all linked together. Data analytics is the hot one. Um, and you'll see here, I, I made this, this is sort of, again, like the bubble chart, fairly representative of the, the average of the customers we've worked with around the globe um, in terms of where they want to be, which is the blue line, as well as where they are, which is the green line. So I think often the biggest, uh, there's a big gap in data analytics, not because people are not doing analytics, but back to the marathon uh, analogy, it's because of where they want to be. Um, they're running already, but they want to get into the Olympics. Um, great example, I'm working with a couple of insurance companies now. Um, they've been doing analytics since the beginning of, the day, the beginning of time. Right? <laughs> insurance is analytics, music of actuaries and, and a lot of that. Um, but they want to actually be much more real-time analytics. They want to have automated pricing. They want to be, you know, they, they really see that data is a differentiator um, and they want to really get to the next level of AI and automation and artificial intelligence. Uh, one of the massive insurance companies I work with is doing a merger between a big London-based and a big U.S.-based uh, insurance company. And the CEO is quoted in the big kickoff saying, we, we merge because of our data assets. The combined data assets of these two companies is the value of the company and the analytics we can do and the actuarial analysis on that. So just proof that data is the new asset of this 21st century we're in. So often when we want to do things like data analytics, um, we're often hampered by data quality. So this is a case where it's not all bad. I am seeing uh, uh, getting old, been around for a while. I think it's actually better than it has been in the past. I do see a lot of people seeing uh, data quality as an asset. They may have dashboards that they, just like we have KPIs for data, they have uh, like my, our company, you know, how much sales do we have? They have KPIs for quality. How many empties do we have? How many um, of these values are not within our business rules? 
So, but with that, the more you monitor, the more you see, right? So there is a gap from where we want to be. If you're making business decisions on this data, it has to be a lot better than it was in the past. You can't really have mistakes. So that's a good and bad. We're looking at it more carefully, but we're looking at it. So but that's a great thing. I think if we move along this little diagram, uh, data architecture is, is a similar, it's a fairly mature field. Um, I am pleased to see often when I go into an organization, they do have a lot of physical data models and data dictionaries in place. Um, often what, what might be missing is sort of the big picture. And again, that sort of relates to governance and in these siloed applications. Again, nobody woke up in the morning and said, you know, I'm going to make it so nobody can see the entire architecture of this organization. It's just that they're busy and didn't have that time to really step back and look at that. But those can be so helpful, even at a high level. I think the other gap we see and maybe it was fine in the past when data was driven by IT more so, but now that business people are more hands-on with the data, this need for business level data models and glossaries um, and conceptual data models, uh, again, what's old is new again, and, and I'm seeing a lot of interest in that. So again, there's gaps there, but gaps because there's more demand and not because people are getting worse. I think people are actually getting better. Um, similarly with uh, data asset planning and inventory, I remember back in the day when I was first starting my career in data management, being very scared. I would go into some of these big companies and uh, I was doing a, a lot of metadata repository work back then. And a lot of our purview was, could you just even let me know what systems we have or what data sources we have? We can't even get our hands on that. And we would just spend months just doing you know, automated scanning and trying to get that inventory together. I don't see that as much. Of course that exists. Um, but I think people know what they have, but they're wanting to optimize it. I think also now that we're looking at this more carefully and there's more regulatory as there should be, especially when it's customer data, uh, I think people are looking more carefully at things like life cycle policies and retention policies. And then particularly with regulation, do we need to store? We might have it. Do we need to? And what, what can we not only for, it's not so much data storage because that, that's so cheap now, but what is, what is a risk um, where maybe we, we don't want to have the liability to have that? Um, data integration, uh, again, I think, you know, things like ETL often is very, for data extract, transform, and load. Uh, for things like data warehouses are fairly solid, generally fairly well documented, which is a change I hadn't seen in the past. People are definitely maturing there. But again, there's gaps because there's so much more opportunity. Things like real-time data streaming. Um, how do we integrate with the cloud and these new technologies? Um, and of course, there's silos because, again, people are just, they have a day job and they need to get things done. So often that big picture integration is missing. And when we look to do things like digital transformation, that's almost often one of the gaps. We need to start looking holistically across the organization. Metadata, my favorite one. Um, again, I, I think you'll see a big gap there because I think people know they need it. Uh, partly because it's a confusing word, metadata. It sounds nerdy and, and techie. Um, so I think people know they need it. They don't know necessarily how. I, I do see a fairly generally some fairly good data dictionaries and maybe some physical data models and things like that. I think, again, when it comes down to the business alignment with that and things like data lineage, that's where people are, there's some gaps exist. But the good news is there's a lot of good solutions out there now. But again, like I said in the beginning, often with those solutions that could be confusing because there's so many options. So I know that was a busy slide and we spent a long time on it, but Often that's one of the first questions I get when we go into a consulting engagement is what are other folks doing? So this is this is uh, based on data we've seen and based on our experiences. So hopefully that was kind of a, a helpful to kind of see where you might fit with that as well. Um, this comes uh, from a, uh, what is it? It's a survey, sorry, <laughs> need more coffee, um, that we had done with Data Diversity. It was last year. So uh, we had sort of promised you the update this year for many, many reasons. Uh, we've had a bit of a gap in our, our traditional uh, cadence, but we will have a new one that will be out in March, and we would love for you to give us your opinion on this. So stay tuned. Uh, Data Diversity will be publishing that shortly, and I'd be really uh, interested to see how this has changed. Uh, what we've seen in the past few, we've done several over the years. Generally, the story doesn't change. It's the matter of um, volume. So maybe more people are moving towards big data in the past, but the general stories have been saying the same thing. So I'd be curious what that, what that is now. 
So the first news here at the top just makes me sad um, is that spreadsheets are sort of probably the, one of the leading databases on the market. Spreadsheets are great. I use them all the time, um, but they have their place. They shouldn't be your master data source for any organization. They're great to kind of do analysis for, you know, one-off type things, but they are too often used for actual industry uh, enterprise data management. The one at the bottom does not bother me. Um, again, uh, stories of our demise are overly exaggerated. Relational databases, despite the hype of they're going away, they're going nowhere. They're still the leader. They're still great. They may be moving to the cloud, but they're still here. Um, what I thought was interesting in this one, there was more legacy platforms than big data in terms of what we're doing today, which means BrainFrame was a fine solution. It worked, right? Am I saying start something new with mainframe? No, um, but they still do exist in, in their these few ways to sort of understand that. When we look into the future, um, not a surprise here, things I've been seeing as well, a lot of people are looking at these big data platforms in a way to really expand their horizons into more big data uh, solutions like Hadoop. Um, movement to the cloud. So again, relational databases aren't going away. A lot of them are moving to the cloud um, as well. But the other thing that I thought was interesting and not, not surprising at all, uncertainty is, is common because when you look at those lines, um, there are, if you look at the previous one, there's a lot of clear peaks. There's databases and there's big data and there's a bunch of spreadsheets. Don't, don't get me started. Um, but when you look at the future as people grow, there is sort of an evening out, which I think is a very positive thing because one, I, I can rant about data. I don't, again, some of you are probably rolling your eyes who've worked with me. Don't get her started. Um, but one of my rants, and I'll, I'll rant a bit more about it, is, is some of the hype of we have a new tool, and when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? And so all of the many of these technologies are excellent choices for the right use case. And often I see customers saying, well, I heard we need real-time streaming. Well, for what use case? Or I hear I need big data platform as a classic one. You might, or maybe you don't have big data. Do you have Internet of Things? No. Um, if everything you have is in a relational database and you're trying to say total sales by region, Data warehouse is fine for you, and you don't really need a big data. So you don't need to jump on every buzzword that's out there. Evaluate it, yes, because there's some amazing things. But um, so I think this this evening out is actually a positive thing. Okay, so in terms of hype, um, I'm a, a fan of of Gartner. They they often have some really great reports. If you're not familiar with them, um, they're a historical uh, analyst firm that has a lot, not only data management where they're very popular, but other products as well. And this is something they do in terms of where are we on the hype cycle? Where are you in terms of peak inflated expectations, the things that everyone thinks can do everything from save their marriage to make, you know, dessert topping at the end of the day. Um, and then when we realize it can't do everything we expected, we have this trough of disillusionment, which then ends up working out the things that are helpful stay and you have this plateau of productivity. For several reasons, A, this is their proprietary <laughs> methodology, uh, and B, I, I sort of think this is, it, it seems a little fatalistic, it just seems a little, you know, we have this hype and then we're in disillusionment, it almost seems kind of like Dante-esque, right, a little dramatic, but, um, so I created my own, um, which is probably equally dramatic in my own goofy way, but it might resonate with you, so I have my... <laughs> Data management mountains of momentum. Okay, that's bizarre, but I had too much coffee one day. Um, but I, I think it's a similar thing, but with a bit of a different take, right? So there's certain things that the market is hyping. Um, maybe it's a good idea. I don't I see a lot of people using it yet. There's certain things that are hype and they're awesome and they get me excited. And we, there's things when you step back of what we can do and we couldn't do before are just amazing and they are gonna help your company get to that next level of sea change, but they're pretty new. And that's why this mountain peak is sort of new. There are certain things that we couldn't do before and are awesome, um, but people just think they're even better than awesome and they're just in the clouds. Um, I'll give you an early high, uh, things like AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning is one of those. Are they helpful? Yes. Are they everything that every vendor says they do? Um, probably not. So uh, the, I'll kind of go through each one of these. Um, there's certain ones that we overhyped and, and then we, you know, the curmudgeons in the world like me said, guys, it doesn't do that. Guys, probably the stuff that's up here right now, guys, it doesn't do that. Guys, it doesn't do, oh, it doesn't do that. <laughs> and the old curmudgeon on the call So yeah, we told you so. so but it doesn't mean they weren't good ideas. We're now just using them in a more realistic way. So and I live in Colorado, I'm a big mountain climber. So this analogy makes 
sense to me that this is your kind of doing the steady climb up a nice hill. And had you just kept walking, you would have been fine. You didn't have to jump the peak and fall back off. Um, just use the use cases for what they need to. Other things along that steady climb um, uh, that um, I, I just reread a, a text. It was it, talking about economic text. that was assigned to me back in college, a random walk down Wall Street, where basically it tells you all the peaks and inflations of Wall Street, but just invest in the S&P 500. And, and just over time, you'll kind of get your steady you know, X percent, right? That's what I feel about some of these technologies, things we've been doing all along. Things like architecture and data models and glossaries and metadata. And yep, they're a good idea and they will continue to be a good idea. And how do we continue doing them? And many companies have, as I mentioned in the maturity assessment, we're a lot better in the industry than we were. We might be overcritical of ourselves, but we are improving. And I think that's that steady climb of things like metadata that are kind of moving up um, as, as people go you know, progressively. So that, that's us kind of get, getting better at what we do. Um, and then on that note of um, of we've been doing things all along, we could have done it sped steadily, but there is technology. I don't want to discount technology. Some of the things we've been doing all along, we can just do them a lot better now. So my analogy is a car, right? So we've had cars forever. They're kind of not new things, but now we have electric cars. We have cars that every time I get a rental car, I'm always amazed that, you know, now they beep at you if you're going to hit somebody or you, not that I would ever. Have that happen to me. But um, it's just, yes, we've been doing things, and, and I'll talk a bit more about things like metadata that we can just do so much better than we could. So hopefully, um, oh, and then at the bottom, um, things we really shouldn't have ever done, and, and maybe I guess the convergence in the call said, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that. And people did, and we told you so, you shouldn't have done. And maybe we've learned from that, or maybe we haven't, but you know, sometimes people do fall off the cliff and, and things we haven't done. So we'll kind of walk through all of these, and hopefully it'll be a helpful analogy. If not, I had fun with it, so. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, this is, and I, I, look, this is definitely one of the, anyone who gives presentations probably goes to the same angst, but I have too many slides. I want to tell them everything. Uh, and you hear, I'm kind of an excitable person, so I do that. So I can't go through all of these. I'll go through a few things. Just the general statement that I've made before, it is an exciting time to be in data management. If you're not excited, do some more reading. There's just a lot of new stuff you can use. If you just sit back and think of, um, okay, so I live out near Boulder, Colorado, and there's a lot of nerds here. One of my nerdy friends, I, I use nerd lovingly. It's a good thing. Um, uh, he, he works for NCAR, the National um, Weather you know, Atmosphere Association, and his dad did too. So you know, we all have the, the dad saying, well, when I was a kid and I had to walk uphill both ways, they sort of had a data version of that where the dad said, did you know that the type of data you can do now with Python and cloud-based solutions and open data sets, you know, we literally had a building in Wyoming that had massive mainframes and we still had a percentage of what you could do. He was so gentle, he's retired now and he's, he's a little mental and he's not able to do what he could. And he was so frustrated. He said, if I had the tools you have now to do this kind of analysis, when you think of it, you literally could sit in your pajamas and spin something up on AWS with some open data sets you downloaded from NASA um, and get some big data storage. Um, you can, you know, there's real-time data streaming, and you can do self-service analysis and, and analytics with things like Python, and it's amazing um, what you can do. So, and there's a lot of good resources. If some of those words didn't make sense to you, um, um, and I've done it myself. I mean, I I did a lot of this in university. Actually, some of this is one of those. It's old, is new again. Um, but things have changed, and things like well, data diversity, of course, things like. Um, um, Coursera and, and a lot of the universities, MIT and Harvard and, and all of the universities have open courses. Um, so take advantage of them. Um, and it, there's a lot of great stuff out there. So this and can and will be if a lot of the stuff we'll be talking about throughout the year. Um, and each one of these could be their own webinar. So um, open data is one I'm a fan of. In fact, I think I mentioned in the intro we have the Environment Agency of England coming on in a couple months as a case study, and they are doing data models and metadata and glossaries, partly because they're publishing scientific data sets to the public. So, uh, and again, I get myself off track, but uh, two, two folks in the organization that had actually met um, through open data because they found there were two people in the world that actually Oh, I forget what it was. It was like weasel scat or something. I know that sounds ridiculous, but there was some animal that they both analyzed the poo of. Um, and they found that other person in the world that uh, loved that too. So not only can you find a 
people that are aligned uh, academically, but you may find your life partner through open data. I cannot promise that. But again, there's so much opportunity, but as with any organization, when there's opportunity, there's a lot of responsibility. So uh, that's where things like metadata come in. Um, the other one, this overhype, um, and I will put AI and machine learning squarely in that category. And this is a uh, um, Matt Veloso off Twitter. I've seen this quote come out quite a few times. It cracks me up. Half the time when companies say they need AI, they really need to select clause with a group buy. You're welcome. <laughs> Not to be an old curmudgeon, um, but again, so many. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm honored yeah, to be able to work with a lot of C-level execs and a lot of big companies um, around the globe and you know, I'll have a CEO come to me and say, what do we need to do for AI? Right? Generally, because um, I don't mind speaking truth to power, <laughs> I said, to see if you actually need that first, right? So let, let's talk about what you need to do in AI very well, maybe, and is it true AI or is it machine learning or is it we could have, again, a whole webinar on what is that? Um, but this is a case I remember in my, yeah, I was an economics major, but I also have a computer science degree. And uh, we did some tests with AI and machine learning. And I remember just being fascinated by that. And had I more time in my life now, I would probably just dedicate myself to that. Because I remember wanting to do more, but we were limited by the tools and the data sets and what was available. But with things like the uh, big data and the fact that you can get these data sets to truly train, um, it really is truly a one of these seed change technology. So yes, it's amazing. And yes, you should be looking at it. And yes, you should take it with a grain of salt that every vendor that says they do AI and every company that says they need to do AI, you may not need to or want to or think of the maturity. You might just need some you know, better business intelligence reports to see how many sales you have by product. And you may find out that I don't even have my product codes rationalized and I have different product codes um, in each country and I can't even do AI because I have crappy data, right? So excuse my language. Um, so yes, look at it, but it, it can be definitely overhyped. Um, uh, one where hype, I think, has settled into reality, and this is where I feel old. Um, I feel old, but then I don't feel old because I realize that time, they, they have dog years and we have technology years where each year is like 20 seconds, I feel like. But I remember when data lakes were the great grand new thing and everything, and so in some ways it still is, and everything can be solved with a data lake and crazy things that I said at the time and no one listened. Um, well, a lot of us listen, folks like university folks, but there was a lot of misunderstanding. You don't need data warehouses anymore. Everything can be put in the lake and you don't need data quality anymore because it's a lake and you don't need et cetera because we have lakes. And that just made no sense at the time and it makes no sense now. Um, a lake is a great thing if you want disparate data sources and you have video files and Internet of Things streaming data and you want a lot of um, raw data to be sourced in a bit of a uh, staging where you can look at after the fact and it's and do some analytics and exploratory analytics real time. You can have a lot cheaper storage, um, a lot of great reasons of a, a data lake, but it is not the solution to everything. So I think people now, the good news is I'm seeing less of that. But what makes me feel old is suddenly, oh gosh, those those data lakes, that's old school. <laughs> hey, wait a minute, that was like 10 minutes ago. Um, because I think there's the just like people said, well, data warehouses, they never work. Um, well, there's plenty of successful ones. We also hear, well, data lakes, they never worked. Um, and I think what, what frustrates me is you can put any single technology in the planet. Well, X never worked. Well, you could do anything badly or you can do things well. And some technologies don't work. They're not the right solution. And we'll get to those. But um, often it's how you do it, not whether you do it or what it is. So, um I'm going to spend most time on this if I have some time. Um, so is I, I think a lot of the fundamentals are still there. And I love this joke. The, uh, it's kind of like the car. There's now an electric car. This looks similar, but it's powered by Hadoop. In terms of we're reinventing the wheel. Um, but a lot of things we've been doing for a long time and are still good ideas, we can just do a lot better with these new technologies. So things like machine learning and, and cloud-based solutions and massive scale can now be applied to things like metadata, which we've been doing forever. And things like um, you could be, uh, again, a little um, contrarian and a lot of other uh, things that are big are things like data monetization of, of you know, monetization of data. And you might say we've been doing that for a long time, using data to make profit, right? So data strategy, it's not like you've never had a strategy before. Uh, microservices, not like you've never broken things up into small little 
areas and different technologies and um, use them that way, right? But but they are different now in the ways we've improved. Um, so I, I kind of walk through these because I, I find this interesting. So this slide, I, I think, sums up, I, I feel, kind of the more realistic view of where data lakes and master data and data warehouses um, kind of can fit together. So are data lakes still valid and viable? Yes. Are master data still viable and in warehouse? Yes. They just have their fit for purpose. And, and so if you think of the data lake as a great place to sort of stream data in this real time, either through a sandbox or through lightly modeled non-sandbox data that I'm really using for true analytics, um, and, and, but it's, it's kind of disparate and, and large volume variety all of that, um, that's fine. You also have data warehouses for some financial reporting and things like that that have to be by definition cleansed. And, and the arrows go both ways. So master data, yes, it's hard to do. Is it valuable? Yes, <laughs> because you need to do good analytics. You need the right data. Um, often master data can be fed into these modeling you know, analytic environments. Should you have security and privacy, whether it's on the lake or not? Yes. I mean, one of my uh, names will be protected for the innocent, to protect the innocent. Uh, but I remember one of my large international uh, financial services clients, we were talking about the lake and PII, PCI and PI. And one of the junior developers said, so I shouldn't be loading the credit card data into the cloud? <laughs> he said, uh, Pradeep, we'll talk to you after the meeting. And uh, so just because it's in the cloud, just because it's big data or... I mentioned to one client, uh, I think his question was, do I still need to worry about PII if it's um, in documents and not data? And I said, well, if someone steals your credit card and they tell you, well, it was it was on a PDF, <laughs> do you care? No, it's still data, right? No matter where it is. So, and that's where that data governance box across the top can help is that you need the teams that are both your document management team and your analytics team and your warehouse team and your business users all in the same room to really get that cohesive scope so that you can do the stuff in the pink or mauve or whatever that color is up top. You can do the true analytics and self-service BI. When it's nice and clean and well organized with metadata, you can do that. And that, and that piece in the right, the old fashioned, you could say data models where what's the product and what's an account, and what's the customer still hold. Because as soon as a, a business person wants to do self-service BI, and they see a list of customers that don't own your product, and you say, oh, no, 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 no those are for marketing. Well, that's not a customer. And all those questions will come up again, even more so, because more people are looking. Um, so I do think, uh, the good news is, I think more people are getting that. I hear less of the hype where everything's a lake, or everything's a warehouse, or everything. I, I, I do see more kind of maturity in the industry that people understand that the fit for purpose. And are, I think some of the challenge is, how do you get the right ecosystem of these fitting together, the integration, not just the ecosystem of tools, but the ecosystem of people, which is that data governance piece. Um, another thing, again, could be several webinars all in once on this, where I do think is a true sea change is this idea of visualization. Um, a, because it's really, really fun, uh, but it does also, especially as more business people get involved, um, they want to see things in a more intuitive way. And as you get these massive data sets, you can't have the report on the left that's total sales by reach. I mean, and in and, and just uh, usability, we're competing with things like cell phones and iPhones and I don't know, Netflix and, right, and we're just used to a very rich visual experience. And, and people want that at work as well. So you see less of what's on the left, which um, again was taken from MicroStrategy. That's not a knock. That was an older report from them. There's nothing wrong with that tool. Um, but um, that's sort of what we were used to seeing when we thought of data. Now, uh, wow, the stuff on the right. Um, and again, a lot of this can be downloaded with open data sets. We're doing graph databases. We're doing you know heat map, literal heat maps. Um, and so that's another thing if you're interested in data and even have an artistic bent, there's whole competitions and visualizations and some of the vendors support that as well. So mm -hmm. there's a, I was lucky enough to hear him speak in London at one of the conferences. Um, data is, information is beautiful. Um, recommend uh, just, uh, there's, there's folks that have not in our traditional industry that are seeing this as well, you know, that are, that this whole art of how do we visualize these massive amounts of information on the planet is just a really fun Thing to be in it and really and I would challenge you and I've done this myself I am so myself so used to sort of showing bar charts and radar diagrams and and uh, kind of a challenge for me when I'm working with the customers how can we show this information in a different way um, and there's so many resources that make my, my head explode that I'd never thought of 
showing something in a way that might have been um, shown before. Or infographics. I mean, I've seen several of the BI tools actually integrate with the marketing infographics tools. Um, it's a really neat way to show information. Um, metadata near and dear to my heart. Uh, so interestingly, we in well, some of these surveys we've had done in the past, um, over 80%, I think that's actually low, said that metadata is as important, if not important, in the past. And part of the reason for that is more people are looking at the data and more people realize that this is a, a business um, asset. So I think this is a, 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 an area where the tools are really helping with technology. So not that either of these doesn't exist in neither uh, in left or right or bad things, but I sort of group the one on the left as your more traditional metadata repository. So the part that is in bold are kind of similar in both tools. So your traditional metadata probably has for your, your data dictionary of structures, your data lineage. Um, most of these, what these more modern are called kind of data catalogs, uh, have that as well. Um, I think some of it is a philosophy and tooling that on the left, as I, you may have heard me say this before, the difference between encyclopedia and Wikipedia, where encyclopedia metadata is this is the definition, these are your curated data sets, thou shalt use them, we've had data governance committees vet them, and these are the standards and guidelines, and here they are. On the right, and again, neither one of these is bad, just think of the use case. On the right is more if you are doing self-service and you want a more collaborative approach, and you have trusted data sets, but sometimes those trusted data sets are based on user ranking. Oh, this is the correct uh, customer data set, or this is the open data I use that's really knocks it out of the park, right? Um, so part of that's a style, but some of these tools, um, and again, it may be an overstatement of, of what machine learning and AI are, um, but some of the old school things we had to do, I remember in the old days, kind of mapping X, 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 dash, S, X, S, X, 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 X is um, social security number or, you know, what an email field looks like and having to, and now with some of this machine learning and training, the systems can sort of figure that out. Hey, by the way, this looks like an email to me. It could be called field one. It looks awful lot like an email. Should we label it as an email? And that's pretty neat. Um, that's so kind of automating a lot of these kind of banal things and having more discoveries that you might have missed in the old way. I think also some of these glossaries, they have more of a Google style search um, than maybe your traditional, you know, glossary type look. So uh, both are fine. Um, I've seen customers go both ways um, and had trouble. So some have used these metadata catalogs with huge success for analytics group. Um, I had one customer that actually had a lot of problems with them because they wanted to really lock down GDPR data. And those, the, the catalogs were at that time and the tool they chose was a little too loose and it didn't let you lock things down enough. So think of that as you're looking at tools. No tool is bad, um, but think of the use case. And of course, as with all tools, they're kind of merging. So, um, but just to give that some thought. But data governance similarly is where I'm seeing a huge evolution. Less the top down, you must do this. And that's, clearly that's part of what governance is, but more with the carrot and less with the stick because once you focus on business innovation and data strategy and we're transforming the business digitally, I, I, I tell my customers this and they often don't believe me. You have people scrambling wanting to be on this committee because you're seeing um, people saying that these are the decision makers. These are the people looking at data for not only how we manage it, but for new opportunities. And I think part of that is this increased interest from business users. Not that data governance ever should have only been an IT thing, um, but in the past often it was. So I think a lot of the change is that business people are driving governance and they're more involved um, and it's a collaboration between business and IT, which I think is a great, a great advancement. Um, and so in terms of traditional approaches that are gaining buy-in, if we're back to kind of our mountains of momentum, um, these tried and true fundamentals are, I think, which keeps surprising me, are seeing a resurgence. I've had so many customers come to me and want a data model. Uh, that surprised me. Um, well, I'm not surprised anymore because it happens so much. Or uh, architecture or even governance is in that category. Master data management. We've been doing this for a long time. Um, just like the wheel on a car. Wheels, I mean, someday we may have hovercraft and not near made wheels. Um, but the you might have better wheels now, um, but you still need wheels. And, and these are kind of the foundational things that don't go away because they, they're really getting at your core definitions. Um, I know a busy diagram, but I'm, I want to do that. Um, so I think partly because more business users are looking at data, they expect to have some of this semantics and definitions. So really fun for me, because as you know, I'm a fan of data models. I have had folks 
um, from scientists. You'll see that the Environment Agency, when they come on to early childhood teachers, we're up on a whiteboard. I give them like three slides of what a data model is. And I kid you not, they're doing box and lines and the relationship diagrams um, with cardinality and all of that. It's an easy thing to understand. I'm like, can a, can a teacher be in more than one classroom? And wouldn't that be, and they'll even correct me, shouldn't that be a, 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 a non nullable field? I mean, they get it, right? So to, I work with a water company. The engineers got it. Marketing, I mean, people will understand a data model if it's done at a high level. Uh, things like data flow diagrams, one of my best favorite quotes, I was working with a chief marketing officer, right? So just think of that a chief. She was very high level. Marketing is not generally who you think is going to get, you know, deep into technical designs. So she said, I never thought I'd use the word data flow diagram in my life, but that's exactly what I needed to see why my campaign data was wrong because she knew her data wasn't great. Um, but we had, she didn't build the data flow diagram, um, but we showed it to her and it was a way she finally understood why the, the data wasn't flowing right. Old fashioned things like data lineage and CRUD matrices, where data is created, read, updated, deleted, where are used. Um, one of my favorite quotes, we were trying to explain why we needed this to finance, finance of all people. And they said, are you serious? You're not doing this already? <laughs> like, we couldn't get away with that in finance. Oh, I don't know how much money we have, but somewhere, not sure the lineage of that. Um, you go to jail for that, right? So um, also some of these um, traditional enterprise architecture diagrams, when you're speaking to the business, again, don't take a year to do them. You can do some of these in a few days or in a workshop or an afternoon. Business process models, where is the data used in the process? What are the business capabilities using this? Especially that last bullet, so many companies now are doing data as part of transformational digital change, which involves culture. It involves a change in process. It involves a change in how you're thinking. So you cannot do that in a vacuum. And you need to link this to what business capabilities do I have today? What business processes do I have today? And I don't want to just take my brick and mortar processes and put them on the web. That's not digital transformation. So especially when we're doing that now, you want to link your data to these bigger picture items. And I've been using them successfully and people, especially business people love them. It's often IT that pushes back. Really? I got to make it so simple? Yes. Because you want to communicate with other people. Uh, that's, that's the goal of these. Um, MDM is a big one that's coming back as well, especially everyone's trying to be customer centric, right? So how do we get that single view of the customer and not only know that Stefan Krauss is the one Stefan Krauss and not 16 of them, but how many purchases he had and where he lives and what his occupation is and he's a loyal member and he finished the Engadinsky Marathon, which is one of my favorite races. Um, and you know all of that about him and that's hard to do partly because you need all of those things we've been talking about, the data models and what processes touch this customer, et cetera, et cetera. But more and more people, one of the first things I noticed with my customers, I want to do digital transformation. I need to start with MDM because I, I don't have a good sense of what my, I want to put all of my products online and have a customer loyalty program. Great digital transformation. Well, I don't have a great view of my product list and I don't know who my customers are. Can't do either of those without good MDM which that would be product MDM and customer MDM. Um, a couple where we're kind of the, the hype up the climbing up the mountain, hype precedes implementation. I would put blockchain in that category. Seems interesting hearing a lot about it. I on and correct me in the comments if you think I'm wrong. Um, I don't see a lot of people actually using it for business. Other, some of the things we've been using. Um, so, um, Great thing to read up. I'm still kind of, it's, it seems interesting, kind of that core technology, uh, kind of the distributed ledger. And then again, we'll give a whole webinar just on that. Um, interestingly, and it could be, you know, maybe data diversity people aren't doing this and other areas are. I just have not seen a lot of it. Uh, at that time, only seven point, almost 8% were kind of looking into it actively, or I think even smaller percentage were actually using it. Maybe next year when we do this, it'll be a different number. We'll see. So take that survey when we have it out. And, hear your response. Um, some things that, I, and again, I am getting close to time and you're, you're lucky because I could probably rant on all of these. But, um, and we love to complain, right? So some things we might not have ever have done and, and you might disagree, but yes, there are the agile folks and we don't want to do any documentation ever. That was never a good idea. Um, and you could say uh, there's been too many teams that sort of want to skip the documentation phase and skip data models and skip glossaries and things like that. Don't skip them, just do them in a better way. Um, data lakes, we talked about that. It's not a replacement for a data warehouse. It's augmenting. 
um, well, we still do this third one, just buy a tool and it will fix everything. No, it won't. You need to use the tool right correctly. Um, and this has nothing to do with data, but open floor plans, who came up with that? I'm trying to do analytics and I have the 16 people right next to my face. Um, not a fan of that one. So I think I've heard other feedback on that and I'm not alone there. So, um, so in summary, um, what is the next big thing? What if Donna Burbank had a crystal ball? What would things look like? I don't know. Here's some of my thoughts. I think the rise in data-driven business and digital transformation will only increase. That's just a trend. That's a great trend. We want to see more of that. Self-service, I see as another trend. We're just so used to having technology at our finger, fingertips and, and being able to be more active in it. Um, and data is hot, so everybody wants to have a finger in the data game. Um, and so there'll be more of that. Partly as a result of both of one and two, the first two bullets, metadata management will continue to grow. And I think there will be more automation, more self-service. And I think there's a place for some better visualization uh, a lot of this visualization we do with analytics can we put on metadata. We're better. Um, I'm still not a fan of a lot of the data lineage I see. I, I think we just, it's a hard thing to visualize, but we're getting a lot better at visualization. So visualization is for, I, I mean, we can do so much with just virtual reality and, you know, visualization, again, we're visual creatures. So I, I think that's even going to get better than we see. Um, and I, I, I sort of teased AI and machine learning because it's overhyped. But I don't see that going away, partly because there is such massive volumes and real-time accessibility of data, which is a great fuel into AI and um, machine learning. Um, but I don't think these foundational technologies that I mentioned, like data models and lifecycle management and business process change and all of that, they're not going away. You need that as part of that foundation to really treat data as an asset. I'd be interested in your thoughts and predictive and predictions in the uh, in the comment section. Um, and just quickly before we go, um, next month we'll be talking about data strategy. Please join us. Um, and we do this for a living if you want to help us know. <laughs> so at that, we want to open it up for questions and comments, and I'll pass it over to Shannon. Donna, thank you so much for kicking off the series and year with a great uh, topic and presentation. Uh, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email for this webinar by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording to all registrants. So Donna, um, nice spider diagram on slide eight. Do you share that for people to take their own maturity assessment? Um, I get that question a lot. We generally, that's part of our kind of core best, core best practices. We walk through it with you. Um, there's about 250 questions, 200 questions and we, uh, so no, we don't just provide that as a download, unfortunately. I will recommend though, there is sort of the CMMI um, has sort of a one that's a little higher level than one we do uh, that you can sort of purchase, I think it's like 150 bucks. And then some of the other, even just going through things like the data management body of knowledge or DAMA DM buck, and kind of looking through that and saying, what am I doing and what am I not? So even without a detailed questionnaire like we do, I think you can kind of do some of your own with some of those tools I mentioned. So those are great places to start. And Donna, do you really think the trend for cloud will continue to expand? It just is it is just a server that someone else owns. The cost cases that I've seen are not that compelling long term. Um, I, I think it will, yes, because it, it may not be sexy like it was, but if I use uh, kind of Gartner's plateau of productivity. I think people are, even myself, I just expect things to be backed up to the cloud. My, my computer crashed the other day and a lot of my files were out in the cloud and it was great. Did I really think about that? No. And that's almost because it's so ingrained. I think a lot of the smaller companies too, who don't have their own servers and don't want their own servers can really leverage the cloud for scalability and testing. So I, I would agree with you. It's probably not in the new hot new technology stage, but I don't think it's going anywhere. I think it will only grow. Um, but I don't think uh, your own server goes away either. I think a lot of people want that, especially for security and things like that, because it is somebody else's computer. So there is a question here, you know, an inquiry. Can you share a larger version of the that capability model with data overlay on slide 22? Um, I can do that also. Um, I think last year we did an enterprise architecture, um, an enterprise architecture webinar, and we went into detail on that. So on data diversity, everything's on demand. Um, and we can, if you, I think your email will be here and we can, I can send you one individually. 
but you might be interested in that webinar because we kind of went into a lot of detail of how you build it and what that is, and we have a bigger picture there. So forget what month it is, but it's out there somewhere. Santa can tell me. <laughs> It'll be out there. <laughs> um, well, um, and we that brings us right to the top of the hour. But let me see if I can slip in one quick question here. What are new innovative methods for creating data model for modern data warehouses? It's not a quick answer, I don't think, but maybe um, we're going to test you here, Donna. Um, well, just to a quick answer, I think from the bottom up, there's a lot of, you know, if you want an existing uh, data warehouse, there's a lot of reverse engineering tools that aren't really new, but a lot of people don't know about them. Um, I think just quickly on the top of new ways, I think a lot of what is design thinking and you know, kind of the young hipsters. Um, and I'm able to do a lot kind of whiteboarding and um, in, in that technology, especially if we start at a high level and workshop things, you know, a lot of, we love to tease millennials, but they kind of are good at some of these <laughs> clever ways to innovate. And so I've been able to just quickly in some of these design thinking workshops come up with at least a rough draft warehouse model, a lot faster than our six month, you know, waterfall that we used to do in the past. So might be a good way to kind of think outside the box and look at some of those techniques sometimes. I love it. Well, Donna, thank you so much, as always, for this fantastic presentation. And uh, Donna will be at Enterprise Data World in March. I'm very excited if you want to meet her in person. And you're hanging out in our new community, which is also very yes. exciting. Community.datorsi.net, a place for data people. I love it. Um, Great. Thank <laughs> I'm you. I'm excited about that. <laughs> 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 so anyway, well, thank you again, and I uh, hope and thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We just love it. Thanks for all the great questions and the engagement. Um, and again, we hope to see you February 18th in the next month's webinar, and hope everyone has a great day. Again, Donna, thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.